everyone and welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. My name is Abby Perry and I work for University of Wyoming Extension. I'm an educator in the southeast area of the state based in Carbon County. And joining me as um, our host today, our other host today is Jenny. She's our small acreage coordinator. Hi, Jenny. Good morning. Good morning. Um, she might be doing a little bit of moving around in the background to make sure that everything is running properly and functioning for us. And then today we kind of mixed it up a little bit and Jeff Edwards is actually joining us as our guest. So hi, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning, Abby. Good morning, Jenny. And he, Jeff is an educator in the Southeast area. He's going to be uh, talking to us about growing in high tunnels. He's also um, done quite a few education workshops growing or with building high tunnels and um, geodesic domes around the state of Wyoming. Uh, before we get into what Jeff has prepared for us today, since we're participating in, participating in a webinar, um, I want to make sure that everybody can get their questions out there to us. So if you are joining us, joining us on Zoom, you can put questions in the comment box or use the Q&A and we'll make sure to get those read and out to Jeff to answer. And then on Facebook, if you want to use the comment option on Facebook, Jenny will be monitoring that so that we can get those questions to Jeff. And I think that's all the things, right? Okay. I think so. You can take us away then, Jeff. Wow, turning it over right to me, ready to go, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we're just going to dive right in. I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of images to share, so. Uh, as Abby mentioned, I am an um, extension educator in the southeast part of the state, but I cover the whole entire state. And um, would like to share with you some uh, things that we've, that I do personally in a high tunnel. Um, uh, so the title is today, A Season of Growing in High Tunnels, or What I Did During Lockdown. Um, and uh, uh, we'll just get right into it. So this is my disclaimer for the program today. This is what the Edwardses do. Your individual results may vary. Uh, and particularly because we live in Goshen County. Uh, we're about 4,100 uh, feet in elevation. And uh, not everybody is the same. So, uh, you know, most I'm I'm going to try and run through a, a whole cycle or a whole year of what uh, occurs in our high tunnels, <clears throat> and um, up until about March, we don't really get too excited because uh, uh, the conditions in the high tunnel are such that uh, the nighttime temperature, the temperature that is outside, is actually the temperature that will be in the high tunnels. So there's not many things really over winter. Um, and so we target the first day of spring as our uh, date that we are prepping and then doing some early planting of things, okay? Uh, and just to kind of show you where we're at, this is a screenshot of temperature data for the Torrington area, uh, March, of, March 21st of 2020. I'd like to point out that the uh, day before, the 20th, we didn't get above 20 degrees. So uh, temperatures in Goshen County are very highly variable uh, this time of year, at least through um, the middle of May. And uh, our, our frost normal frost free date is about May 15th. Uh, so, um, you know, we're pushing the envelope, actually, the ability to use a high tunnel that's uh, in Wyoming, their season extenders, so we can grow earlier in the spring and further on into the fall. This is our structure. It's a metal frame structure. It's uh, 32 by 30. Um, and uh, it's covered with a woven polyethylene skin. <clears throat> Can, how did you guys decide on that size, Jeff? Was it what fits the space or did you think about what you wanted to grow in it and make it that size? I knew you were gonna ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there was an individual uh, nearby who was actually selling a structure, and uh, their structure was 30 by 96, I think. And I bought the whole thing, uh, used some for demonstration. But uh, in our space, we only had enough room for about 30 feet. So uh, 
I bought the frame and then uh, went from there, figured out what okay. to do with it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's kind of whatever works for you, right? Your space. Um, I, I put in Dutch doors on all of my structures just because uh, um, it helps us keep out rodents and critters and those types of things and still be able to open up the top and uh, um, allow some ventilation. We do have roll up sides on it, but uh, as the season progresses, we'll start to roll the sides up. But my roll up sides are, um, I, I have screening uh, in the window space. So uh, actually when the season is going and when all the insects are active, uh, I have ventilation, but I am able to eliminate a lot of the insect problems. And did you do any kind of initial like dirt work before you put the structure on that space or did you do the structure and then? Yeah, so this space was our garden space uh, to begin with. And I went in and I dug the topsoil out, which was only about six inches worth of topsoil. <laughs> and um, uh, the side where the raised beds are, that's the side that I dug the soil out on. The, the side where it's not raised beds, that's the original soil. And then I um, was able to use the soil that I scooped out and put into the raised beds. So the soil that's underneath the raised beds is kind of a clay, caliche, hard pack stuff that uh, um, isn't the best for growing, uh, for growing in. Okay. Uh, you know, we're starting in March. There's a few things that will overwinter, and we were just kind of playing around, and I, I put a cover over the top of this cabbage. But um, a couple of things going on here. It will probably bolt. Uh, so it, this year it would be, or, or this year that it's growing, it would be a seed production head. Um, this cabbage was actually harvested, and then this next uh, growth is uh, what regrew after that. So uh, but Jeff, by sure. bolting, you mean it'll flower and then produce seed. And so does that affect the quality of the, uh, the vegetable? Is it good to eat anymore at that point? Oh, it wouldn't be good to eat at all. <laughs> what <laughs> happens is the head will split and then it'll send up this flowering stalk and then it'll uh, flower, of course, and produce seeds. So the, it basically becomes um, inedible uh, as, as far as what we know is what a cabbage would be. Um, it leaving it out over winter, it actually becomes a trap crop for aphids. Uh, so um, the benefit of that is, okay, so you have this nice little aphid population growing, but you can pull this and chuck it outside and uh, take the aphids with it. So uh, it's a biological control method. <laughs> Other things that we had over winter that year, uh, this is kale. Um, you know, it'll grow back and probably the same type of thing. It will probably bolt and produce seed. So uh, not really edible, but uh, things will overwinter in a high tunnel. It's just, you have to uh, care for them a little bit more. We have a bed of raspberries. Uh, again, this is March and the raspberries are uh, coming up out of the ground. They're actually uh, doing what they need to do to get going. A um, couple inches worth of growth. Uh, strawberries are thinking about waking up and doing their thing. Uh, I was telling the ladies earlier today that uh, as a kid, I always wanted to have moss, but um, moss is not a thing that you want in your garden. So uh, we had to figure out a way to kind of clean all of this up. And uh, I, I think it's, we didn't seem to have much of a problem last year and I don't know what the difference was in 2021. So uh, it's just one of those things. And, and what's the problem? Is it taking up prime real estate or why don't you want it? Yeah, it's competing with space, right? Or competing for space. Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing to have that growing right up next to your plants. Okay. Uh, the one thing, I, this is the same day. This is still March 21st. Uh, I'd like to point out that the temperature didn't get above 50 outside, uh, but we were working in there and it was 90 degrees. So it's very very nice March day, nice uh, nice day to be working inside or in a protected space. Uh, what we do to prepare our beds is we have um, compost. This is not manure-based compost. This is all uh, leaf litter and uh, grass clipping-based compost. And 
I might have said this in some of the previous programs that people have participated in. I am not a good composter. I'm a passive comp. I'm a pacifist when it comes to composting. So uh, our compost pile just sits there, and when it rains on it, I'll maybe go out and turn it. Uh, so it might take several years before my compost is actually ready. Uh, but this is close enough. It'll decompose even more when I put it into the beds, and um, uh, it works pretty well for us. Maybe past, maybe I'm just a lazy composter. I don't know, <laughs> but we'll uh, we'll wheel it in in wheelbarrows, or we'll uh, scoop it up in five gallon buckets and haul it into the high tunnel and distribute it around. And uh, I know probably to uh, Caitlin Youngquist's uh, chagrin, or, or or this probably goes all the way against what she says, but we we feel that we have to incorporate this uh, material into our raised bed, so we actually use the shovel and, and turn the, the material over to try to get it incorporated evenly. <clears throat> and this is, so when we put the, uh, the original soil back in to the raised beds, we also uh, added compost at that time. And um, it, it's pretty obvious that some of the beds are a little bit different than the others. So uh, it, we didn't have the same ratio of soil to compost, and and um, so it's it. Uh, some of them are a little; they produce a little bit differently. Some of them are a little bit easier to plant than others. Um, so, <laughs> point is, it, no magic amount of things in that. There's a fair amount of wiggle room in. Yeah. Um, no magic. <laughs> no ratio. <laughs> Uh, this is what it kind of looks like after after it's smoothed out. Um, there's still big leaf chunk, chunks, uh, but they do decompose and and um, other things. Uh, this particular bed, for whatever reason, it seems to be a little bit smoother than the others. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know if there was more soil in it to compost, but um, uh, it's just one of those things. And again, the one right next to it's a little bit rougher. Don't know. Maybe we didn't mix one up more than the other. Maybe we did mix one up more than the other. But anyhow, uh, we put compost right over the top of the raspberries. Uh, that seems to be just fine. It incorporates itself as it breaks down. In the rest of the high tunnel space, in the uh, traditional lanes where we grow, um, I use a broad fork to break up the soil. And uh, what it does is you poke it in and, and um, just pull the fork back to you and it, uh, it'll break it up into these clods. Then we'll put the compost over the top of it and I'll go over it with the broad fork again. Okay, uh, so, you might- Jeff, we ahead. have a question. In some of those previous slides, you could get some good images of um, the kind of material that you were growing in for those raised beds, like what they were built out of. Um, oh, yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so there's a company in Torrington that's um, uh, Nature's Composites. And they create or um, it, a product like Trex. It's um, uh, usually decking material made from recycled plastic and uh, wheat straw. And uh, the, the beds that I have or the frames for the beds are four by four posts that they made. They're hollow um, and they're seconds. So uh, I was able to get them at a discount and, and they work really well uh, for uh, framing out the beds. They are starting to break, break down a little bit. Uh, they'll crack uh, if you're not really careful, um, but uh, uh, they work really, really well for beds. And then my irrigation system, I use um, drip tape. Uh, everything's on a timer and um, one drip tape per row is sufficient. And here, you know, I'm just putting trellises and those types of things back up after I've incorporated my uh, compost. Uh, Jenny asked me to talk a little bit about varieties of things that I use. Um, I use. Can, go ahead, Jenny. That, Jeff, sorry to interrupt. We had a question. They wanted to know how much compost you put on and when you put it on, like your strawberries and your raspberries that are perennial, even if they're starting to grow, do you go ahead and put it on? Yeah, even though the for the strawberries and the raspberries, even though they're starting to grow, we do put it on over the top of them. Uh, strawberries, as they as they grow, they grow. Um, how do I describe this? Uh, 
they they are actually putting on new leaves it, it kind of grows like a um uh, uh <laughs> like a palm tree out of the top it continues to grow up and what you need to do is make sure that you have soil up to the crown of that uh, strawberry. And so each year you need to probably add soil to your bed in order to keep the strawberries productive, um, soil or compost. And I'll probably put in an inch um, of compost in those beds uh, so that I'm not smothering the new growth that's able to grow through that material. It's usually light, pretty light and fluffy. So that was that part, Jenny, and I know that there was a part B to the question. I think you answered it. Oh, I got it. Okay. So, All right. So what, what time do you put it on? I think what, um, well, so we're still in March mm -hmm. in a high tunnel. Now in springtime, if you're outside, conditions are going to be different. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I generally purchase seed from two different suppliers, either Harris or Johnny's. I know that there's a bunch of seed suppliers out there, uh, but these guys are pretty um, pretty good. I like the foil packs. They're, they're not foil, they're plastic packs um, that they come in. It helps, to me, I think it helps preserve and keep the seeds viable longer. Um, but uh, the Scarlet Nantes uh, carrot, we've been growing for several years. I really like it, it has a nice flavor has a traditional carrot shape. Um, if, you're, uh, if you have the ability, I would recommend using a planter for carrots. I do not like to thin carrots whatsoever. Uh, and so using a planter, it, it meters out the seed so that there's not a whole bunch out there. And I also prefer to use the pelleted seed. Um, it's just easier to handle. Uh, the size of the seed is uh, more uniform. And um, it looks like this, and it's usually a clay, a clay pellet that, um, uh, or a clay product that's uh, covering the seed. And so it helps retain moisture uh, around that seed. And um, it just breaks down as the seed germinates and, and um, we go on from there. So you think you have about as good a germination with the pelleted seed as the unpelleted? Yeah, I think so. Uh, they're just easier to handle for me. Um, yeah. And if you're lucky enough, use a planter. <laughs> I wish I had one. Mine are always too close together. And then if I don't get out there and thin them, they come up like little pencil sticks. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So um, yeah, I, I really don't like to spend the time to go back in and thin. Um, and then uh, we have, we usually pick two different types of spinach, two different varieties of spinach, just so that uh, um, they might have a little bit different maturity time. They might have a little bit different uh, leaf shape. Uh, so we choose these two, Olympia and uh, Seaside. We've, Olympia is usually the standard and we'll throw in something a little bit different for them. Um, and then I uh, have a premium greens mix that I like uh, from Johnny's that's, um, it's brassicae species, which, uh, uh, so it's not traditional lettuces, it's um, other things like mustards and and um, uh, pak choy and those types of things that grow really well in cool, moist soil, soils. So do you use that for fresh salads or for cooking more? Fresh. Cooking? Yeah, we rarely will cook them, but but you could. Um, and so these are, are these are small seeds again, and I don't use the planter for them because uh, it's just the two of us. So I don't need a whole row of lettuce or greens or spinach. So I will plant little blocks, maybe a foot and a half long. And uh, I'll just take my finger and draw a line and um, put the seeds in by hand and then uh, cover them up and pack them down. Jeff, when you pick out what you're going to grow, is it things that you've seen in like the seed catalog and excited to try or what you find in the grocery store and you can, you know, grow at your own place or what kind of helps you or what drives your those decisions? So we have a rule. We only grow the things we like to eat. Right. And because, uh, you know, if you're looking at those seed catalogs, you get a little bit overwhelmed and and uh, it's, oh, look at this great tomato. We should try it. Uh, we're kind of traditionalists, I guess. Um, uh, I find a variety that I like and then I'll grow it. Okay. Um, if that variety, if they happen to be doing research on that particular variety, 
uh, there's a, a, a musk melon that we like that they've they no longer make it available so it's become obsolete so we've had to find a different musk melon type that we like so it's just one of those things that um uh, it's your own research right it's uh um if you enjoy eating it great but if they discontinue it then you got to find something else uh, Jeff, we had a question that had to do, um, they asked, where did you get your little cold frames, which I think are your little cloches that you got on there? These little things. Um, out of a catalog someplace. <laughs> I can't tell you where we got them. Uh, I do, I, they're, they work really well, um, but it actually took three of us to build them. They were very difficult to assemble. <laughs> oh, so they came in a kit? Yeah, yeah they came, they it. came in a kit. Yep. Um, uh, and uh, it, it was a very frustrating day for, for three of us. <laughs> my, my mother, if she's watching, she was involved. <laughs> there you go. Helps to have help. We also had another question, but it had to do with uh, the, how the high tunnel was built. So if you want to talk about that later, we'll get into that. Oh, how the high tunnel was built. Okay. All right. We'll save that for later, I think. Uh, Remind me. Talking about varieties, we had a question on what types of musk melons are you growing? Um, we used to grow Gold Star and Superstar. Gold Star was discontinued. We tried a, um, a cantaloupe last year, I believe it was called Hannah's Choice. And, you know, once, I think once you start or once you grow musk melon and you uh, really like them, it's hard to uh, like cantaloupe anymore. <laughs> They're just sweeter. The texture is a little bit different. And uh, so we've, um, I've ordered a new variety this year and I, I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called, but uh, we'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing to do after you plant, right, is start watering, try to get these things to germinate. And um, uh, I go in about every morning spend 10 or 15 minutes pulling weeds, watering, those types of things. And it keeps everything pretty well managed in check uh, first part of the season. Oh, in this image, you can see the screening that I use on the uh, roll-up sides, okay? Did you water for the first time when you planted or did you do any sort of like preparatory water for that? before you planted into it? Yeah, so this is actually the first time that we start watering in March, but um, I'm not planting everything right now, right? So the, the rest of the places where I'm going to plant, I also start watering because inside of a high tunnel, it's kind of a desert situation. And if you, if you don't, to me, if you don't pre-water the spaces where you're planting, it takes forever for things to germinate and you're getting that you're getting that compost to kind of break down and you're just, it's just another way to prepare the soil and, and get you ready to go. Uh, carrots can be kind of tricky to germinate. So we actually um, cover them with chunks of uh, uh, the, the, the high tunnel skin material. It uh, maintains the humidity and keeps the soil moist and consistently moist from day to day. And it also uh, makes it just a little bit more warmer in there so I can get the carrots to germinate in March. And um, I kind of learned that trick from an old master gardener. He used to plant his carrots and then uh, put a, a one by four over the top of the rows to um, keep the moisture there and, and keep it going. Jenny, do you do the same type of thing? Yeah, I have a row cover that I use because it's up more outside, so it helps keep it. But I have a friend who actually uses, um, they're like the little mini blinds that you don't see them quite as often. They're used to little oh. like bamboo slats, and they'll yeah. place them over there, and so that works well, too. They don't blow away? <laughs> no, she must have weighed them down a little bit in our area. Everything's weighted down. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, and then after after we're done, we're uh, spending a little time enjoying uh, the greenhouse uh, during that 90 degrees. So March is over with. We're now into April. And um, I do monitor the soil temperature. Uh, first part of April, soil temperature is hitting 65 degrees. So basically, uh, things that you want to plant can be planted. But the nighttime temperatures, again, 
uh, can still inhibit the growth. So things do need to be covered. Speaking of temperature, we had a, just had a question that asked if you use shade cloth on your high tunnel. Shade cloth. Yes, I do use shade cloth. And I put it on about the 20th of May. To keep the heat down, right? To keep the heat down, yes. Since I leave it closed up to try to avoid some of the insect problems, uh, I use a 30% shade cloth. Uh, so look, uh, corn is germinating the first part of March, which is, or first part of April, excuse me, um, which is a little bit uncommon for um, uh, most areas. Um, I, again, I told the ladies earlier, I try, my goal is to try to have sweet corn by the 4th of July every year, but I consistently have it by the 9th. I can't get it quite on the 4th. But um, part of the reason for that is, uh, um, if you grow sweet corn in a high tunnel, the rodents get in there and love it. And they'll just go right down the row and dig it up as it's germinating. So that's one of the delays of game that we have for, for uh, getting corn to go. So uh, that you need to have an aggressive baiting program in place to manage uh, the rodents so that they're not causing problems for you. Uh, again, it's been two weeks. Uh, the the uh, carrots are germinating. And by looking at it here, you might think that, oh, that, that's pretty thin. I like my carrots to be planted a little bit thicker. But as, this, as the season goes on, uh, you'll see that it uh, works out just about right. Okay. Uh, this is the bed of greens. On the right-hand side is the, uh, uh, the, the green mix, those coal crop uh, mixes. And then my, I have two varieties of spinach and then radishes on the end. I didn't mention anything about radishes, but uh, they're one of those first things to go in. Uh, and within two weeks, that greens mixture is, um, you could start clipping it and enjoying it. We had a question that uh, it was kind of in more general and how do you pick out types of seeds that work for the Wyoming high desert, our area? How do, you pick, how do you pick out, how do you pick out Texas seeds? No, seeds for our, our area, for Wyoming, ones that'll be suitable to grow in our climate, basically. Um, timing's everything, right? <laughs> basically, uh, if you look at the seed packet and it has anywhere from 100 to maybe 115 day maturity on them, those types of things will grow in Wyoming. Am I correct, Jenny? Yep. So okay. more it's cold that's the issue when you're growing. So when you're growing vegetables, you're going to be watering them. You're not going to have much production at all if you don't water, whether it's outside or inside a high tunnel. So then that comes to more to issue of how long is our growing season. And that's dictated by when the cold comes and how soon and how often. Yeah. How many extra days do you think the high tunnel gives you on both ends, Jeff? Do you, do you have an idea? Um, so if, if I was to plant traditional crops outside, I wouldn't start until about May 10th or a little bit later. So if I'm starting the middle of March, I've already added two months, right? Okay. And then uh, on the end, on the back end, that's even more variable because uh, we can get a killing frost in September. Okay. Or it might not show up until October. Um, and I... I think, if I remember correctly, we are usually producing in the high tunnel something and into November. Now, uh, the first high tunnel that we put up in 2011 in Goshen County, uh, we were able to grow throughout the year, except for two weeks in February. Now, you can't grow everything, right? You can grow things like spinach or, or something that has a really short, short growing time and is a little bit more cold tolerant. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you can, if you push it and you cover things, you can get it, get them to grow. So you can extend that season even further. Now, again, that's Goshen County for, for right. you, Abby, that might not, you might not get that amount of time, but you can still right. extend it quite a bit. Yeah. Right. Like my disclaimer said, your individual results may vary, right? Right. We're we're more of a, a June first, fifty percent frost, but I mean, <laughs> but I imagine still the high tunnel could add 
I mean, that takes us from a growing season of 75 days to well into the hundreds. I mean, that's awesome. That yeah. gives you options. So, so the research says that for every layer of plastic that you use, you gain one USDA growth zone. Okay. Um, so you could use two layers and actually increase the days even further. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just threw this picture in here to show you that, you know, we cover everything up. We usually use ice cream buckets or um, uh, floating row cover to try to cover things up at night and just retain some of that heat that's built up uh, in the soil and uh, kind of protect those more protect, uh, more sensitive plants. Uh, again, why do we use row covers? It's because we have these dips of temperature in April and May, right? And I'm, I'm sure that's uh, pretty uniform for the entire state of Wyoming. <laughs> uh, you know, during the day, we'll pick them up and we'll fold them up and put them to the side and try to keep them out of the way. Uh, but as we progress here, you can see that things are growing. The carrots start uh, filling in a little bit more. Uh, soil temperature on this particular day was 59 degrees. Uh, I think we'd had a series of cloudy days. Uh, so the... The soil temperature will change a little bit, not a whole lot, but um, uh, it, if it's not if it's not a series of clear sunny days and you're not getting those multiple days of heat, then the soil temperature will start dropping. So Jeff, when you see soil uh, seed packets, oftentimes they say plant it when the soil has reached a certain temperature. When you put your thermometer in there, how deep do you put it in to measure your soil temps? I don't put it in any further than an inch. Um, it, it, most of the seeds that we plant in our gardens aren't going to be deeper than that. Okay. And there's also a question about if you use any sort of passive uh, heating methods. No, I do not. You could. Um, th there's a manufacturer in California of a non electric pellet stove, it's all gravity fed. Um, I think if you knew that you were going to have some cold nights uh, and didn't have electricity in your high tunnel, you could use something like that. It supposedly heat will heat uh, 2,000 square feet. Um, it might not heat the whole entire structure, but something like that could work. You'd have to vent it outside, of course, but uh, uh, that could be one way to, to do that. Um, you know, strawberries bloom really early in a high tunnel. They're... Uh, they're getting after it. Uh, carrots continue to grow. And so these are the peppers. And uh, like I mentioned, at nighttime, we'll cover them up with the, uh, with the ice cream buckets. So Jeff, you've mentioned a couple times, like, so at nighttime, you're covering some things. You also mentioned about rolling up some of like your row covers. How much time are you spending in your poop house, like on a daily basis, doing some of these little chores? Half an hour. Okay. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night. Okay. And, you know, it's really comfortable in there. So uh, why not get out and enjoy it? Right. <laughs> uh, you know, as the season progresses, things just continue to get bigger and greener and uh, just keep going. Uh, we do not grow uh, cabbage from seed. There's, there are certain things that we buy starts from, from our local greenhouses. Cabbage is one of them, peppers, tomatoes. Uh, although this year, I actually overwintered one of the tomatoes that uh, um, we like. I, I took a cutting of it in 2019, fall of 2019, and uh, overwintered it in our house and kept it going. So um, uh, I can show you that in a little bit. You know, corn's at two leaf stage. Um, just things just kind of keep going. Oh, I, um, yeah, I don't, I purchased tomatoes as well. So Jeff, I've been bouncing around looking for questions and stuff, so I don't know if I missed it, but a great picture, because I was just going to ask you to tell us a little more about your irrigation system. <laughs> so the irrigation system is using drip tape in uh, at least one line in each bed, probably two, but I have individual valves on them so I can kind of adjust the amount of water that they're receiving. And if they seem to be getting too much, uh, I'll shut one of the lines off in the raised beds. Um, 
I try to plant things in the raised beds that have the same watering requirements so that if I'm not using that particular bed or everything's harvested out of that bed, I can turn it off. Um, try. I don't, I don't necessarily do that every single time. Uh, but I use a really simple timer mechanism, and I usually put this on about the middle of May. Uh, this, of course, reduces the need to go out and water on a daily basis. Um, and in our space, I set it to run, I believe it's a half an hour every day. Uh, and, I, and I set it to do that about noon. Um, and my, my reasoning behind that is that uh, it's keeping, it, it's watering during the heat of the day. And um, it's allowing those plants to remain moist uh, from day to day. I have a really sandy soil. Uh, it's 92% sand. So that's the reason why I water as long as I do and the frequency that I do. I have the same timer that I use at my house for watering. Oh, a different time of day, but same timer. They're, they're really easy to program. I'm, I'm into simple, right? <laughs> uh, and this one has multiple, I've set it up so it has multiple zones on it. Um, and uh, one couple of them go outside, two of them control the water on the inside, and I'm still able to connect to it and hand water as well. Uh, so this is one of the zones outside, and um, I have potatoes planted in the two outside lanes and uh, garlic, and you can see that they're growing, and uh, that was the end of April. And so now we're into May and uh, should be harvesting and eating greens. And the carrots are starting to fill in. There's some other things going on. Uh, the, the corn is uh, up to a foot by the first part of May. Those cabbage plants are uh, beginning to leaf out and, and uh, do their things. Uh, the strawberries are actually putting on fruit. I don't know if you can see that or not here, um, but things just kind of grow and progress. And, uh, even so there was that time consideration question once you put the water on a timer the amount of work that we're doing out there is insignificant uh, and I'll go out and pull weeds for 10 or 15 minutes and I'm done the other thing I try to do is I try not to walk in the rows where the watering lines are so I have compacted soil in between, uh, but where the planted rows are, it's, it's, you can tell that the soil is a little more fluffy and, mm -hmm. and uh, better for the plants. Jeff, going back to your cabbages and tomatoes, you said you often buy plants at your local um, nursery to plant. So one of the folks wanted to know, is there a particular reason you do that rather than raising them in the house? I'm lazy. <laughs> I figured it'd be time. <laughs> it's time. It's going to... It's convenient, right? Um, uh, we'll go to the greenhouse on a Saturday and go pick things up and go get them in the ground. And it's just a personal preference. I don't have time to germinate a lot of stuff other than where it needs to be. <laughs> uh, this is the tomato variety that I actually overwintered. It's um, uh, uh, one of those um, golden cherry tomatoes. Can't think summer, I want to say summer bliss, but I don't think that's right. Maybe Diane yeah. can type in the chat what the variety actually is, it's sun since gold. I know she's watching. I'm sorry? Sun gold? Sun gold, possibly, yeah. But it's May, right? And I have tomatoes blooming. So raspberries are starting to bloom. Strawberries are producing uh, corn. Everything just kind of continues to grow, right? Uh, potatoes outside first part of May have started to come up and you may or may not be able to see this or not but they have been frosted a couple of times uh, I could if I wanted to cover them with a uh, floating row cover but the wind you, you either have to really anchor it down or not do it and usually uh, potatoes recover uh, pretty well from a couple of light frosts the so, answer is there's sun sugar sun and sugar since you have the screens on your greenhouse and stuff, so you're not going to have a lot of bees and stuff coming coming in. Do you do anything particular for your tomatoes to get them to set, or are you just letting go? It's all natural. <laughs> I do not worry about pollinators. There's plenty of stuff flying in and out of there that uh, that 
uh, even though I have screen up, I still have things like moths and flies get in and and uh, so there's go ahead the Dutch doors are open right uh, no doors? not necessarily okay. um, Dutch doors are not open uh, we will open them um, just to kind of moderate the temperature early on in the season okay after okay. after we get to May and it's we stop having frosty nights we'll roll up the sides and close the door okay so I can see your raspberries there. I was thinking when you showed us earlier in the, when you're just starting out for the year, are you growing primal canes then? You, so you cut them back down each year? Yes, these are primal cane uh, a variety of raspberries. If you do choose to grow raspberries or blackberries in a high tunnel, I suggest you pick a thornless variety. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it, nothing, there's nothing more frustrating than getting tangled up in a bunch of thorny bushes inside of a high tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> um, broccoli's doing great. Uh, you know, the different cabbages are looking pretty good. Uh, the peas are four feet tall, first part of May. Peppers are starting to, uh, I think there might be a blossom or two on some of these. For whatever reason, we don't grow peppers very well in our high tunnel. Uh, usually because they become infested with ants and, you know, me being an entomologist, I should probably take care of that, uh, but I'm slow to react sometimes. Uh, usually when there's, when I find lady beetles out and about, I'll catch them and shove them in there. Uh, they may hang around, they might not, it just kind of depends. Um, uh, it's just, it's just one of those things. <laughs> um, are those your cucumbers there? Jim? Yeah, these are our cucumbers. And so I, I might have mentioned this earlier. We don't plant everything all at the same time, right? Cucumbers are one of those things on the packet. I think that the seeds say that they have to be six, the soil has to be at least uh, 60 or 70 degrees, something like that. And so we wait a while for uh, cucumbers to, to plant the cucumbers. And I, uh, I don't like wasting space in a high tunnel on vining crops unless you can trellis them. Uh, it's just, it, it, otherwise things just kind of take over and, and they're really hard to manage. Okay. For your other crops, like the greens and stuff, do you do a lot of succession planting? You probably should, but we don't. Um, it's, it's one of those things where uh, you're really excited to get things going in the springtime. And then uh, you, you consume them for a while. It's like, well, I've, I think I've had enough of those. So maybe I'll move on to something else. No, we don't. We do not. You can only uh, eat lettuce. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've tried, we've tried um, planting for fall. It's always been a failure because by, and I'll show you, by the end of August, we have other things that we're interested in doing. Um, so here we're into May and the corn is tasseling. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's right in the center there. Um, there's a better picture. Um, carrots are filling in. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it looked like they might've been a little bit thin, but as you can tell, the, I think more of them have germinated. And so there are more plants now in this space. Uh, the kale, of course, um, uh, we have other um, herbs and things in that particular bed. Basil. When you look at those carrots, I'm sorry, when you look at those carrots, do you have a good sense of how big they are underground by looking at those tops? Or is it always sort of just a surprise when you dig them up? Um, I will, I will actually choose a few and um, clean out around where the green, where the top of the, the uh, carrot is just to kind of get an idea how big they are. So I know that, okay, hey, they might be ready to harvest. Okay. Yeah. So here we are mid-June, okay? Uh, carrots are filling out. Uh, corn is pushing five feet tall. Uh, cabbages are forming heads. We're still uh, uh, waiting on cucumbers to do something. And uh, strawberries are still producing. They're starting to um, uh, put out runners at this point in time. And I usually trim all of those off. If your if you're strawberry plants uh, if there are more than six per foot, the plant density is too much and the quality of your berries and the size of your berries will be reduced. So you might want to manage how many plants are actually in the bed. 
Um, pepper plants starting to blossom. I think we had one die that we replaced there. Uh, peas are doing their thing. Uh, broccoli, this head is probably going to be harvested within a day or two. This one has already been taken. We do leave our broccoli plants um, after we harvest them because they will form new heads and uh, uh, they will continue to produce for quite a while. We've got tomatoes starting to show up. There's a question about what variety of strawberries do you plant? Uh, that's a question for Diane. Maybe she can answer that because I can't come <laughs> up with it right now. I could if I think about it. Um, I want to say Jewel. Maybe. She'll clarify that for us, I'm sure. Uh, again, things keep going, right? <clears throat> and by this time, the carrots. So this is a one gallon ice cream bucket just to kind of give you an idea where we're at uh, as far as size, perfect eating size at this time of year, right? Uh, if you continue to let them grow through August or September, they'll be, oh, very large in diameter and it'll take about four carrots to fill the bucket. <laughs> so- I'm also wondering June. if you're eating all the ice cream for those buckets, Jeff, you've got them on all sorts of plants. Um, I don't eat that much ice cream, uh, <laughs> but Diane's brother does. Okay. <laughs> so uh, cabbages are ready, getting really uh, ready to harvest. The um, sweet corn is silking at this point in time. Um, uh, just moving along, right? And it will grow and reach the top of the high tunnel where it, the, at all the points there. Raspberries. This might have been a little bit more of a cloudy day. Um, the uh, the peas are foot and a half above the trellis, just reaching up there. Harvesting peas, found the first raspberry. Tomatoes, peppers. Can you adjust your irrigation timing as you go along? Let it run longer as the season gets warmer? Um, sometimes, it just depends, right? Um, if I go in there and I think, hey, things are looking a little dry, I'll bump it up, maybe 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, it, you just have to kind of get an idea. If, if things are looking stressed, definitely. Yeah. Um, cucumbers are finally starting to vine. <clears throat> uh, started to harvest cabbage. And again, you know, that's the size of a one gallon ice cream container, just to give you an idea. Uh, and I think you'll, you can notice that the screening on the roll-up sides significantly reduces the insect problems that I have. Uh, uh, so it's just a, it, it, it's just a way that I manage the, the baddies in there. We do have other problems, uh, particularly mites in the raspberries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll use a horticultural oil on them. But it depends. The interesting thing is it depends on the year. So if it's a uh, more of a humid year, we don't have mites so bad. Mites prefer hot, dry uh, conditions. And so last year in 2021, we didn't have any mites whatsoever in the raspberries. And it was the best raspberry crop that we'd ever had inside the high tunnel. So uh, uh, it's just one of those things. Um, Corn's, the corn's ready today. It's July 9th. <laughs> so uh, uh, this, this particular variety is Montauk. It's a really good eating ear, really nice flavor. Uh, and when we first moved back to this area, uh, we did some research with a bunch of different sweet corn varieties just to find the one or two that we liked. This is it. Um, so Can you repeat that name again? Was it Montauk? Montauk, M-O-N-T-A-U-K. Okay. Okay. So sweet corn by July 9th in our country is uh, uh, not very common. <laughs> it also looks, I've got it a couple times while you've looked at the, you've done the corn, Jeff. Is that planted more dense than what you would normally plant outside? Yeah. And thanks for noticing, Abby. And I probably shouldn't, I probably should have mentioned that. Um, since my irrigation 
system is set up on 48 inch centers. My, I'm afraid that uh, I wouldn't get enough corn plants in a single row in a single space. So I double, I double the, the amount of corn on either side of the drip tape. Here, let me go back. Let me, let me find a, yeah, I don't know if you can see it or not. Not in that one. Maybe one of the next ones. Uh, but I'll, I'll plant on both sides of the drip tape. Okay. And uh, I'm, I usually will plant them about five inches apart from each other. And that allows for all the pollination that you need. You don't have to worry about going in there and it, it's all gravity pollinated, right? So when it falls off the plant, it's gonna pollinate the, the pollinate itself. Uh, so I don't have to worry about uh, any of that. Nice, dense, thick uh, uh, stand of corn. On your cabbage there, um, we had a question from one of the viewers that was wondering if you have trouble with the cool season crops bolting much inside the high tunnel. No, I don't. Um, I'm usually eating the cool season things before it gets really, really hot. Um, if I leave spinach, it will bolt. Uh, but that's usually the only thing. And usually by this time we're done and not planting anymore. So <laughs> uh, blossoms finally on the uh, cucumbers. Everything is, oh, here I've, uh, you know, I've started harvesting carrots. So you can kind of see further on into the, into the um, raised bed. Uh, beans, I haven't talked anything about beans, but these are uh, purple green beans. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, my thought is if they're purple, they should be easier to harvest. <laughs> Not necessarily, because <laughs> the stems are purple too. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting bean. They turn green when you cook them. They taste just, they're, it's, a, it's a green bean, it tastes just like a green bean. Um, peppers again, they're blooming, they're doing their thing. Peas are starting to decline a little bit. Uh, this is the sun, what did Diane say? Sun gold tomato? Already, it's uh, producing tomatoes already. Um, sun so sugar. Oh, sun sugar. Yep, thank you. Uh, mid to late July, things just really kind of take off, right? Um, uh, you might be able to see that the shade cloth is on. So here's a, can you see my pointer on the mm -hmm. screen? So here's the corner of the shade cloth, and then it got, goes up and over the, the uh, high tunnel. Raspberries are really kicking in, and actually they're starting to senesce a little bit on the bottom. Uh, this could be due to some of the mite problem that we were having. Um, here's my peppers, and if you are able to, you can see that they're infested with aphids, unfortunately. Uh, and it's one of those things, it's like, yeah, I'll get in there and take care of it. Well, aphids under optimal conditions in a high tunnel can uh, double their population size every three days. So if you don't get after it right away, there's really no stopping them. They just kind of do their thing and take off. Uh, the beans that particular year had um, mite issue as well. Um, still harvesting carrots. The uh, strawberries are done and I missed a picture. I missed a step here. But uh, this variety of strawberries is a um, June bearing strawberry. And uh, after they produce their fruit, you have to go in and mow everything off, clip off all the green. Uh, that's, this is the time when you add a little more compost if you want to, and um, just kind of keep every clean thing cleaned up. But this is all the new growth or the regrowth uh, after that step had been uh, taken care of. Uh, corn's done. So why leave it in there, right? I uh, clean it out, throw it out in the compost pile. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're moving on. Um, cucumbers are producing now and we get into August and what happened? Well, <laughs> Diane and I have other interests <laughs> and um, uh, we were planning a trip in Idaho. And of course, with everything being shut down in 2020, we, uh, op we, we cancel all that trip. 
and uh, opted to go for a bike ride in Fremont County instead. So that's what we did. Uh, things, once we got to August, and, and for, for us, um, once we get to mi midway through the growing season, I'm really enjoying the garden. I've got other things that I want to do. And so gardening becomes less of a priority. And unfortunately for you all who are watching this, I stopped taking pictures <laughs> that particular year. So um, I, my interests shift and my responsibilities shift as well. Um, by September during 2020, we were able to kind of get out and do a few more things. And um, uh, I have been building and showing people how to build geodesic domes the last three or four years. I actually work at the research facility in um, Lingle. Uh, it's called CERIC. And uh, the geodesic, they used to have a high tunnel out there. It was uh, 21 by 72, I believe. Uh, the wind got up underneath it and just destroyed it. So they wanted something different after I'd been building these domes around the state and asked me to build a geo tunnel. So it's a geodesic dome on both ends and then um, tunnel pieces in the middle. And this one is, this one also is, I believe it's 71 by 23. Um, Jenny, did you have a question? Yeah, one of our um, participants had a question and it came in earlier, but they're wondering, for the high tunnels, like the regular high tunnels, what kind of reinforcements do you need to combat the wind in Wyoming? And just so you know, I put in a link to the your article on 101 ways for a high tunnel to die. Oh, okay, so, perfect. Like, um, uh, concrete. <laughs> so, um, uh, the the steel frame one that I had or that I use, uh, those ribs are actually. Um, I believe it's two and a half feet down and I concreted them in. If you're in Laramie or someplace like that, you need to go at least four feet down uh, to um, keep them in place. And there's a series of purlins uh, across the base and across the middle that uh, hold it together and keep it from uh, vibrating. What's a and, purlin? Oh, a purlin. Uh, if you can see... Can you see my pointer? Yes. Yep. So this, this horizontal structure here in this particular build would be considered a purlin. Uh, usually the purlins will run across the base and they tie all of the ribs together. Okay. Um, and you can put them however many feet apart that you want. The other thing too to consider is uh, rib spacing. Uh, you could put them as close together as three feet apart, but I wouldn't go any further apart than four feet, uh, particularly in our weather, in our winds. And did um, you, at one time you were recommending um, like strapping to go on the outside of a high tunnel to help. Yeah, so, so batten strap is a, um, a critical component. And if you, uh, the batten strap needs to go in between the ribs on the fabric from side to side and pull it as tight as you can to keep the fabric from flapping. And that will prevent wear and tear of the plastic. And so that batten strip, it's kind of like the stuff you use on seat belts, like right in cars, it's that. Yeah, the, the, the stuff that I use, I mean, there's a lot of things out there that you can use for batten, they call it batten tape, it's not sticky. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, uh, if you're familiar with a company called AM Leonard, they have rolls of uh, seconds of seatbelt webbing that you can purchase relatively inexpensively and um, uh, use that as the product to batten and because it doesn't rot, it doesn't disintegrate. Uh, it's really tough stuff. Um, this is just some more of that really long structure. And instead of putting roll up sides on it, I put in a bunch of different vents. Uh, these are louvered vents, they open up automatically. Uh, so it kind of takes out some of the work of that. And that's some of the things that I'm incorporating in the uh, geodesic domes. This was the last dome that I put up uh, in the year uh, 2020. It was a workshop that we did in Fort Laramie, Wyoming. And um, uh, I, I recruit the people who show up to work and learn. 
I hope that that's what they're interested in doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the structures that we've been doing um, and building around the state, they're 22 foot diameter geodesic domes. And um, uh, they are made out of a wooden frame and they use uh, PVC hubs with uh, connectors in them. Uh, that's how it's all held together. I've got one of these at Wheatland and uh, it was reported, I think three weeks ago that they had 85 or 95 mile an hour straight winds. And this thing, it, it just shed the wind like magic. So um, building them like this, there's, there aren't any wear spots because we use uh, lath material to hold the plastic down on each, on each rib. Uh, each one of these things so the plastic if it's not tight it could potentially flap but it's it's going to last a whole lot longer i think than a regular high tunnel and then this is what the finished structure looks like um this particular one i spent a good portion of 2021 helping them uh, get it ready for planting so i put raised beds on the inside raised beds on the outside and by um, i believe june they were ready to go. Uh, I kept telling them, "Don't overplant it. Don't overplant it." And I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't include a picture. But um, uh, by August, uh, the plants were so big in it, they had a lot of they had a lot of tomato and and um, cucumber plants. But uh, you couldn't even walk into it. <laughs> the plants had the plants had just kind of taken over. It was pretty amazing um, how well it turned out. But uh, in December of 2020. They um, uh, lit it up like a like a uh, a ball, I guess, a Christmas ball. Let's nice. put it that way. It was kind of nice. Um, okay. So that's all the images that I have. Um, I Sweet. wow, we're really close to right on time, aren't we? Yeah. Um, so we had a uh, question on. You're showing like the louvers for your long geodome for ventilation, but we had a question about the high tunnels when you use that batting over it. Does it interfere with raising the plastic vents on the sides? No, because, uh, well, it can, if you get it really tight. So I, I have a, uh, a purlin that is the stop point for the roll up sides. And I will attach the batten tape from the top of that roll up side point from side to side. And then I will run it beyond that past the roll up side itself. So. Uh, I get the top really tight and then the side, I make it a little bit looser, but it still is tight enough when the sides are rolled down that it holds that side from flapping. We had another question about the plastic used on the geodomes. How often does that need to be replaced? So we use a woven polyethylene product and there are a bunch of different sources out there. Um, I mentioned A.M. Leonard, they have theirs, dripworks.com, they have theirs. There's a manufacturer in Poncha, Tula, Louisiana uh, called J&M Industries. Um, that's the one that we first started out with. Uh, I've tried some of the others. They perform similarly, um, but the six millimeter product from JM Industries has lasted over 10 years in some installations. It just depends on how, um, if they're not allowed to flap in the wind and, and wear that way. And then there are a couple other questions, Jeff, um, going back towards the end of the inside images that you had with your growing. Um, there was an image that you showed of holding up some vegetables. If you're using baling twine for the top string to hold up those crops. Oh, do you remember? Uh, um, yeah, so I use, I use baling twine a lot uh, to um, hold my trellises in place. And um, for the tomatoes, uh, the indeterminate tomatoes, I use a product, it's called a Tama hook. <laughs> it, it, um, it's a piece of hard wire uh, that has string wrapped on it. And um, you, you unwrap the string, hook it to the, your anchor point up top, which is baling twine, and then um, clip the 
they're, they make specialized little recyclable clips that you can um, clip around the string and around the plant of the tomato itself and help hold it up. Okay. And then there was one more question about, um, does a bad aphid problem in one year carry over to the next, um, even if all of your infested vegetation is cleared out? Not necessarily. Um, it can, well, if you don't have any vegetation in there going into the fall, you should have eliminated your aphid problem. Okay. But if you have, if you have multiple, uh, if you have different types of plants growing all year round, so the aphids that I have will move to the strawberries and then they'll move to the coal crops or the peppers. So they, they, they're able to live, maybe basically survive on the strawberries over winter. Um, and then they'll move back to the peppers in the spring. So do I have a perpetual problem? Yes. <laughs> But because I'm an entomologist. I, 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 it's okay. Yeah, he likes <laughs> and the other thing that I've been doing is uh, we have a native, well, I don't know if I would call it native now, but we have um, uh, praying mantis show up in our neck of the woods here quite a bit. And I'll catch them and chuck them into the high tunnel too. So uh, I, am, I am working on biological control. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it, it, you have to watch it and you have to take care of those things and manage it. You have a really great publication now that's on managing insects in high tunnels. I do. Um, do you need a link to that? Yeah, I was just going to go look it up, but I may not have time. Um, I can't ever remember the number on it. It's, uh, I think it's, it, it's a BR. It's been uh, revised. We'll see if we can find it. If you don't find it here, look on Facebook and I'll put the link up there after we're done. So I'm say I have a whole stack of them right over there <laughs> that I can't reach. That doesn't help us. Darn. <laughs> it's great. It lists, it goes through, if I remember correctly, it goes through a list of a um, bunch of the organic type um, pesticides that go through biocontrol and does, it has con conventional in there as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it starts out talking about uh, integrated pest management and how to use the different tools that are available to us, um, not just pesticides, but there is information in it uh, using traditional pesticides as well. It's yep. really handy, concise resource. And we'll put this recording up afterwards. Um, I'll have it if you go to our website, which we'll show you here in a minute, we'll, along with the recording of this particular presentation, I'll have links and I will create a link for that one so you can go straight to it. It'll probably be in the afternoon. This is today. Okay. Did we get all the questions? I think we did. We got some awesome ones today. Excellent. I have nothing more to add. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I'm just going to share out a little bit of our page so you can see where stuff's at. So this is our main website that we have for the burners and backyards. If you want to get um, the schedule for more of the shows, you can just click on this live. And all you need to do is search for Barnards Backyards Wyoming and we'll pop right up. See, so these are some of our upcoming shows. And as you can see, they have this link for the recordings. So when you click on that link, it will show that we have links to the recording and also to the other resources that were mentioned in the show. Abby, do you want to talk a little bit about our extension offices? So we have, um, every county in the state has an extension office in it with a um, variety of people who can uh, help you with any of your questions. So Jenny's pulling up a map right now of where those offices are located. Um, as I mentioned, as I gestured over of my stack of publications, a lot of times we have publications right there in the office that you can um, swing in and pick up some of those resources that Jeff has talked about. And, our, our other posts. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for being our guest today and Abby for being one of our hosts. It was yeah. really informative and I got to be nosy and snooky. I keep wanting to see the inside of your height to know, so I got it done. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad, I could share. I'm glad you, uh, glad I could share. And Abby's up again next week. <clears throat> yes. That'd be awesome. 
We'll be talking next week about keeping critters out of your garden. So join us for that one. Thank you all for joining us today and have a wonderful Friday and a good weekend. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Bye-bye.